Once upon a time, there was a tribe of people who lived in a dark, cold, isolated land. No one even knew that there was a sun. They slept in caves, and the children would often huddle together and cry against the chill. Loud and long they wailed. It was all they did because it was all they knew how to do. The sounds in the cave were all sorrowful, but the people didn't know it, for they had never known joy. The spirit in the cave was death, but the people didn't know it, for they had never known life. Ah, but one day they heard a voice, a strange voice. I've heard your cries. I felt your pain, your chill. I've seen your darkness. I've come to help you. The cave people were frightened because they'd never heard this voice before, and hope sounded very, very strange to their ears. How can we know you've come to help us? You have to trust me, he answered. I have exactly what you need. The cave people peered through the darkness at the figure of the stranger. And all of a sudden, they could see he was doing something, stacking something, then stooping, stacking more. What are you doing? One cried. The stranger didn't answer. What are you making? Silence. Please, tell us, demanded a third. Suddenly, the stranger knelt down, took a match, the wood ignited, the flames erupted, and light filled the cave. The people turned away in fear. Put it out! Put it out! It hurts our eyes! Light always hurts before it helps, he said. Just step closer And the pain to your eyes will soon go away. Not I, said one, nor I, said another. Only a fool would risk exposing eyes to such brightness. The fire builder stood next to the fire. Would you prefer the darkness? Would you rather be cold? Don't consult your fears. Take a step of faith. For a long time, no one spoke, and the people just hovered at her in groups, covering their eyes. But the fire builder, he stood next to the fire. He says, hey, it's warm here. Come. Step into the ring of light. All of a sudden, a voice from behind said, he's right. The stranger turned around to see a woman slowly approaching him. Well, I can see. Come closer, said the fire builder. Take hold of my hand. She did. And she stepped into the ring of light. Why, it's, it's warm. And she extended her hands and sighed as the chill began to pass. Hey, come, everyone. Feel the warmth, not only on the outside, but on the inside. My, my fear is beginning to fade. Hey, shut up, woman cried one of the cave dwellers. Dare you lead us into your folly? Leave us. Take your light with you. The woman turned to the stranger. Why don't they come? They choose the chill. For though it's cold, it's what they know. And they'd rather be cold than to change. And live in the dark, she asked? Yes. And live in the dark, he replied. You see, there are reasons that people live in the dark and don't come to the light. is a light that shines in the darkness there is a light that shines in the darkness his name is Jesus 
His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You have that light? You have that life that he offers you and me? If you turn in your Bible to the book of Colossians, we have this Christmas series. We're calling it Out of the Box. By the way, you cannot contain light in a box. And we've been going through this passage here in the first chapter about what he has done for you and for me. And I want you to focus your eyes on verse 13 as as we begin. For it says, for he rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. What else has he done for us? In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And if you jump on down to verse 19, it says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him that is Christ. This one who is the image of the invisible God, the one who's the firstborn of all creation, the one who's created everything that you can see and everything that you cannot see. He's the one who holds everything together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning and the end, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might have to come, become first place in everything. I hope he's first place in your heart. That you have a very fond affection of this one who rescued you. This one who has come to redeem the world. So the light becomes human. This invisible God, this one you cannot see, has become flesh now. Someone said, it, wasn't there a, a, a little less expensive way than for God to come into the world and then for his son to die upon a cross? No, there, there was no other way. And notice, it was the Father's good pleasure. Our Father has desires, He has pleasures, He has wishes. And one of the longings of His heart is is to make Himself known. Those of us that are dads here, we, we long to make ourselves known to our children in significant ways. We want them to come to know us. We want to have a friendship with our children. When the, when the little guys are little or little girls are little, we, we reach down our hands and we love to walk with them. That's what God wants to do with you each and every day. That's why he became flesh. Not some God who speaks from outer space, but some God who comes that has skin on, approachable, available, accessible. The Apostle John, or Apostle Paul writes in 1st, 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 these words. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness. And if you remember the first chapter, some of you at least, in Genesis, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and you know it was formless and it was void and it was dark and all of that. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And as we've studied here in Colossians, as Curtis shared with us, that, that uh, this one here that he's talking about, the Lord Jesus, is the one who created everything, the universe, just by the word of his mouth. He spoke it all into being. But notice what he really longs for. He longs to shine 
his light into the dark recesses of your heart and my heart and to give us the light of the knowledge of of God in the face of Christ. You see, Jesus puts a face on God. As one great missionary said, if, if God isn't like Jesus, I don't want anything to do with him. It was the Father's good pleasure. The Father longs to make himself known to you and to me, and so the light becomes human. All of the fullness And so our Lord said when he was here on earth, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen me, you know exactly what God is like. That's why I encourage you to read the pages of Scripture. Read the Gospels and see what our our Savior is like, this one who's become human. But not only does the light come, but the Son becomes sin. Look, look at verse 20. For through him, the one that has all fullness, that's God in the flesh himself, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And so he's made peace for you and for me. The son becomes sin. The other day I was reading in Psalm 90, I think it's the only psalm that Moses wrote, but Moses uh, writes in verse 8, he says, Lord, you have placed our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Imagine corporately if all of our sins and all of our iniquities were all placed before God there would be quite a number. Mine alone would outnumber the very sand of the sea. But God's placed them before. Why? So that he can cleanse them all. So that he can forgive you. So he can take away all your iniquities, all your sins. And we just read about this. How does it happen? How can God, can he just wipe the slate clean and say, I I just forgive you? No, no, no. He's righteous, he's holy, he's just. He has to satisfy his justice. And so in the Old Testament, once a year, the blood was sprinkled there in the Holy of Holies on the mercy seat, and the sins of the people of Israel were just rolled ahead, rolled ahead, rolled ahead until another time. And then one day, as recorded in John chapter 1, John says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of our iniquities, all of our sins, all of our transgressions. And we just read about God's good pleasure. The Lord, the Father was pleased to crush his son if he would render himself as a guilt offering. For all of your guilt, for all of your shame, for everything that you have ever done and everything that you will do in the future, he was pleased to crush him. We read earlier in that chapter in the book of Isaiah, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for Glenn's iniquities. The chasing of our well-being fell upon him by his scourging, by his death. We are healed. We become his. Through the blood of the cross. That our God came in this, the most humbling sort of way, as a baby in Bethlehem, in a stable, and then to to die on an accursed thing, a cross? As I've said before, the cross is a window in which you can see the very heart of God. His heart for you, his heart for me. Ah, it's, it's amazing. But now look what he does. He not only reconciles you because we were strangers and enemies, but, but it says here in verse 22, 
Well, verse 21 tells us that what we were formerly, we were formerly alienated, and we were hostile in mind, and we were all engaged in evil deeds. Evil deeds. Not like, well, they're, no, some are bad. No, evil deeds. All of us. He's now reconciled you in his fleshly body. He had to become human and flesh. Fully God, fully man. To represent both and to bridge the gap between us. Now, no, now notice. In order to present you, he's writing to a church. He's writing, it would be like writing to Valley, to present you before him, this is before the Father, because of what Christ has done, holy, blameless, beyond reproach. In God's sight, that's the way he sees you. If you're in Christ, holy blame. May not be your practice, may not be my practice on a daily basis, but from a positional standpoint, the way God looks at his children. The unclean become holy. The Old Testament says that our righteousness is like the filthy rags, like that of a, of a leper or some diseased person. That's our righteousness that we have to present before him. But you see, God was in the Lord Jesus, and he was reconciling the whole world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. God's a good counter, by the way. <laughs> but he's a better forgetter. He doesn't count them against us. He doesn't point his finger at us. People do. You may yourself. The enemy surely does. Points his finger. But God made him who knew no sin. So you see, in verse 12, it says, he qualified us. We're all disqualified. We, we've run outside the lane. We've run in someone else's lane. We're there's no way we could get in the race. He's qualified us to share in the inheritance in the saints of light. That we might become the righteous of God. Those unclean rags that he might fit us with the robe of righteousness. That's how he sees his, his, his children who have come to him. To present you before him blameless before God. Such a deal. <laughs> <laughs> that he could cleanse my, my heart and cleanse our conscience. The scriptures tell us from dead works to serve him. Now here's the fourth thing I want you to note in this passage of, of scripture. I want you to look at verse 26. Uh, some of you really like mystery novels. Patty, by the way, she, she likes mystery kind of things. I'm not quite as into it as she is, but uh, she does. Now, God himself is a mystery. And there are many things in the scriptures and what goes on in the world and has gone on in, in the past that we don't understand, that we just can't quite figure out. But here is a mystery <clears throat> that has now been revealed. This mystery, which has been been hidden from past ages, but has now been manifested. Notice who it's manifested to. It's not manifested to everybody. It's manifested to his saints, the set-apart ones, the ones he's, he's opened up their heart and shown in their dark hearts the light of the knowledge of Christ, whom God willed to make known you see, our God is always wanting to shine light. He always wants to reveal himself in our lives, in our experiences, through our personalities. What is the riches of the glory of this mystery? Among the Gentiles, that's us, unless you're Jewish here today, which is 
And here's the mystery that was hidden for all these many ages. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, this was prophesied in Jeremiah and Ezekiel that one day God is going to come because in the Old Testament they had the laws, they had their tablets, they had all these things they had to abide by. But one day he was going to come and he was going to take away their heart of stone and he was going to give them a beating heart of flesh. And what Paul is saying here, this mystery that was hidden This God who dwells in unapproachable light is now going to come and he's going to abide in you, in me, in all whose heart he has shown in. So that you're never alone. We call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. See, it was all predicted. John, who baptized in water, comes along and says, hey, I baptize with water for, the re- for repentance, but he who's coming after me is mightier than I. I'm not fit to untie or remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Fire purges, takes care of impurities and whatever it might be. And that's exactly what we studied when we went through the book of Acts and we're talking about the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, he came. The Holy Spirit came. And there were sounds and there was wind and there was fire. Tongues of fire, actually. And the Holy Spirit came upon all of them. They were all baptized into the body of Christ. And they began to talk about the mighty deeds of God, what he had done uh, for each one of them. Christ inside. Christ within. That's Christmas. It's not so, it's, we like to keep him wrapped up in some little package with a nice little bowl around it. Somebody gave me this today. Oh, two pieces of this is 140 calories. Okay. <laughs> but you can't keep him boxed up. You can't box up light. In him, there's no darkness at all. There are reasons why we like to stay in the dark, and and the reason, one of them, Jesus himself says, is because judgment has come into the world, and people love darkness more than they love light. Some of us love our cell phones and our movies and our other things more than, than we should, for sure. No, I'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. I'll change you from within. And so, 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 so this is what happens. The enlightened ones, those who he's shown in his hearts, we become lights. If when Jesus came into the world, the land of Natale, the land of Zebulun, where the people there sat in, a, in darkness and upon them a light dawned, and we talk about a tribe of people who knew nothing about light. They lived in this dark, desolate place with dark, gloomy clouds. That's Silicon Valley. Humanism, secularism, materialism, power, greed, corruption, distractions. Those are things that envelop the very streets, the very highways that you and I drive on, walk on, and so on. Jesus isn't here anymore. Himself, physically, and now he's in us. You see, we're all formerly darkness at one point. That's who we were. But now... We're, we're light in the Lord. Now we're to walk in a particular manner. And we're to represent him. We're the, we're the only light that the world's got. The church, his people. Come January the 5th, we start a new series. And we're going to be focusing on the Sermon on the Mount. 
In the Sermon on the Mount, when you get it on the 14th verse, it says, you are the light of the world, Jesus said. We're it. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We're not to hide what we believe, what we think, our convictions, and so forth. We're to live them out. We're to confront injustice. Where there's so much darkness and so forth, that's where God sends his people. We're the light of the world. So what's up in 2020? Well, I'll tell you what's up. Let your light shine before men, before fellow students, before your employees. Notice this, in such a way. There's a particular way that they may see your good works. These good works that God ordains for his people that we should walk in them and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You're at Homestead High School, you're at Cupertino Middle School, you work at Apple, you, you work at Google, you work at Facebook, you look, work wherever you work, wherever you go, in your neighborhood, you're the light. That's it. I was telling uh, Andy and Kurt today, I met a guy in the, in the gym yesterday named uh, Sam. He was carrying these 85-pound weights, one in each hand. He's walking like this. I tried to pick one up. You, you can't even pick up an 85-pound weight. He's a baseball player. He actually was a, a former, um, uh, well, he was in Andy's uh, youth group at another church, Andy Drake's youth group. Plays baseball for Cal State Monterey. His forearms, they're bigger than my, my thigh, for crying out loud. Huh? He's got a couple of friends that go to William Jessup University. He was at Jackson State last year. He says, what an experience down there. He goes to a Westgate Community Church now. Huh? I met him over there. There's someone in the service here that used to be a trainer at, uh, at uh, uh, 24 Hour Fitness that uh, I gave a hug to today. <laughs> she, got, she came to church. She, she's a master trainer over there. Wherever we go, we're to talk to people. We're to build bridges with people. We're to let our light shine in such a way. You see, if you continue to, to allow him to open or shine his light into the recesses of your heart and you keep giving things over to him, the path that you will walk, well, it's like the light of dawn that comes brighter and brighter until the full day. And the more you look at him and behold him in the pages of Scripture, he'll become greater and greater and greater, and you'll become less and less and less. And you'll start talking about that which has grabbed your affection and attention. It's like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. I was up at 10 minutes to 5 this morning. and The sun was up there somewhere. But it wasn't shining yet. Okay. Kurt started this series about a box. Huh? He had this box up here, and he had many, many things inside. What, what do you think... Uh, what gift do you think Jesus wants you to give him this Christmas? He's not interested in your money. You just gave it all to him anyway, just a little bit ago. No. There's, there's just one thing he wants. Your heart. Because he can take it and he can change it so that it beats for him. He can conform it. I had someone after the first service come up to me who is a first-time visitor who spoke to me in broken English and said, I like that picture that you showed there with the three crosses in the middle. Because the gift that the Lord Jesus wants from you this Christmas is yourself. He just wants you. He wants access to your life. 
Everything is open and laid bare. Don't try to hide from him. That's, that's an exercise in futility. Let him shine in your heart and in your life. Let him open up and keep the cross at the very center of all that you do. I'm reading a book by one of my favorite authors right now. And the title of the book is Self-Surrender. And if you've been around Valley Church at all, uh, you hear me chat a lot about this. <clears throat> the reason is, is because self-pity, self-hate, self-rejection will keep you in jail, in prison. And you need to deal with it, and you need to come to your senses and give yourself totally over to him. If you don't, <laughs> I don't hold out much hope for you. You got to go to your own funeral. If you want to try to find your life, you got to lose it for Jesus' sake. You try to hang on to it, it'll escape you every time. There's no joy in, in self serving, it's temporary pleasure. Moses forsook the temporary pleasures of this world, considering the reproach of Jesus greater riches, for he was looking to the reward. And if you think about Christmas, self-surrender is the very heart of God, and failure to yield is the root cause of most of our problems. The reason you have problems in relationships, the reason you have problems at the office, the reason you have problems with yourself is failure to give over. You want your own way. From day one, first breath, we want what we want when we want it. And unless the cross operates in your life, unless he shines his light into your heart, I don't hold out much hope for your relationships. You'll survive, but you won't thrive. And if you think about Christmas, the surrender of yourself to the Lord Jesus is the highest form of worship. It's nice to sing. It's nice to give. It's nice to do those things. But he just wants your heart. There are so many distractions you need to eliminate and concentrate. Or you won't live in the light that he has for you and for me. In this book, Self-Surrender, <clears throat> from a missionary who was 58 years in India, in about the middle of the book, he quotes these, uh, or he writes these verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So, we were all in jail, we were all disqualified, and he comes and he rescues us, he bails us out. He puts us in Christ. He reconciles us to himself. And then he comes and he lives in our hearts by faith, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So what's the biggest blessing? The biggest blessing is that we're now his inheritance. And we have an inheritance. And this writer says this. Well, it's taken right from the scriptures. Everything belongs to you. Everything, he says. And he met, lists off some, some uh, uh, Paul and Apollos and so forth, some teachers. They, they belong to you. The world belongs to you. The whole world, it, it belongs to us. Life belongs to us. Death belongs to us. Death is only a passageway to going home. I had someone upstairs today tell me, hey, my, my father is 84. He just died and went to heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, we don't weep for those who are in Christ. No, it's just a passageway. To be absent from this body is to be at home with the Lord. The present belongs to you. Today belongs to you. Tomorrow belongs to you. The future, everything. Everything belongs to you, it says. Not either that's true or it isn't. Gosh, I got everything I need, huh? So do you. 
How do we know? Well, it says you belong to Christ. The tragedy in our day and in our country today is people don't belong. They're isolated. They're lonely. They're dying inside. They don't have any hope. They don't have any community. We live these individualistic lives with our devices. No, you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. You see the union there? Huh? He's come so that he could dwell within you and dwell within me and dwell within us as a body of Christ. Yeah, it's Christmas. He's come. And he's coming. And he's coming for his own. And he's preparing a place. He can do it in a second, but he's been doing it now for 2,000 years. I think it might be pretty great. And we've got a feast awaiting us. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, where he, the bridegroom, is coming for his bride. I, I, I just saw a ring today on somebody's finger. They just got engaged yesterday. They're wishing and hoping and wishing. And it'll, huh? it'll happen. Yeah. But we're looking forward one day. To the feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, this one who stretched out his hands for you and me. We have a wonderful Savior, a powerful King, a risen Lord. See, we make much of the cross. We have a good theology, a lot of us, about that. We have a poorer theology about the resurrection. And frankly, the life of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, they do you absolutely no good for your sin and my sin. Apart from the cross and the resurrection. Otherwise, Jesus is just a nice example. But it's the death of Christ, and it's the resurrection of Christ, and it's the ascension of Christ and it's his present ministry as high priest that you can go to him anytime, any day, anywhere with anything. That's Christmas. Father, we praise you for your loving kindness, which is brand new today. As the rain has come down, so your loving kindness comes every single day. It's like the dew. It's fresh every morning. Great is your faithfulness for us. By the way, Lord, as we're, you know every person here, you've placed all of our sins, our secret ones, in the light of your presence. And if there's anybody here today that's hiding something, if they would just come clean and come to you and admit their sinfulness, their lostness, their loneliness, their fears, their doubts, their shame, their guilt, and that Jesus is the answer, that he's the forgiver, that he's the cleanser, that he's the reconciler, that he's the conqueror, uh, they would be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into your kingdom, the kingdom of light, and they could walk with their little dicky hands in your great mighty one. And so would you shine your light into some dark areas today, dark areas of marriages where people are not surrendering one to another, in families where it's selfishness instead of sacrifice. It's where the cross, where you have to operate, where we humble ourselves and give in to you. You just want access to every area of our life. So thank you for this morning. Thank you for this passage in Colossians. Burn it into our hearts for Jesus' sake. Amen.